Our second reading comes from the book of Galatians, chapter 5, verse 22 through 6, 10. Please listen for God's word to you today. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, competing against one another, envying one another. My friends, if anyone is detected in a transgression, you who have received the Spirit should restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Take care that you yourselves are not tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. For if those who are nothing think they are something, they deceive themselves. All must test their own work. Then that work, rather than their neighbor's work, will become a cause for pride. For all must carry their own loads. Those who are taught the word must share in all good things with their teacher. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked, for you reap whatever you sow. If you sow to your own flesh, you will reap corruption from the flesh. But if you sow to the Spirit, you will reap eternal life from the Spirit. So let us not grow weary in doing what is right, for we will reap at harvest time if we do not give up. So then, whenever we have an opportunity, let us work for the good of all, and especially for those of the family of faith. I'll try to keep it short today. I recently heard a story told by a missionary named John Hess Yoder. John Yoder served as a missionary in Laos. While serving in Laos, John Loder learned that prior to the colonization of Laos and its neighboring neighbors, when the colonists imposed national boundaries separating the nations of the region geographically, the king of Laos and the king of Vietnam had an agreement concerning taxation within border areas between their two nations. People who ate short grain rice, built their homes on stilts, and decorated them with the Indian-style serpents, were considered Loatian and paid their taxes to the king of Laos. Whereas people who ate long grain rice, built their homes on the ground, and decorated them with Chinese-style dragons, were considered Vietnamese and paid their taxes to the king of Vietnam. The exact geographic location of a person's house did not determine their nationality. Instead, each person belonged to the kingdom whose cultural values he or she exhibited. In this agreement between the king of Laos and the king of Vietnam, John Yoder recognized an analogy for the Christian life. As Christians, we live at the border between the world and God's kingdom. As citizens of God's kingdom, we should exhibit the values of God rather than the values of the world in our daily lives. But do we? Do we truly exhibit the values of God in our lives? Do we act any differently than other people? Do we act any differently than those who believe in God but do not attend church? Do we act differently than people of other faiths? Do we act differently than atheists? Can other people recognize a Christian by the way they act or the way they live? If you are a Christian, does it make a difference in who you are? I googled this question. And I must confess that I was rather concerned by the responses which I found online. The first response that Google offered me was a rant. A rant posted on Sojourners entitled, Can You Really Tell the Difference Between Christians and Non-Christians? The author's conclusion was there's no visible difference. 
Specifically, he states, if you were to go to the grocery store, a football game, the gym, a school, or your work, there would be no obvious way of identifying through actions who is a Christian and who isn't. Indeed, he asserts that some of the kindest, nicest, most authentic and wonderful people he knows don't believe in Jesus Christ. Whereas, contrarily, he knows some horrible, mean, downright nasty Christians. My first reaction when I first began reading this post was, oh, it's just an angry atheist blowing off some steam. But then I read this line, as Christians, we're often taught that we're happier, more spiritual, and generally better than everybody else, but we're not. We. We. The author said, we. The post was written by a Christian. The second response that Google offered me was a post entitled, Does Christianity Make a Difference? In this post, the author offers, and I quote, a somewhat depressing set of statistics for Christians today. In this post, the author presents the results of a number of sociological studies which reveal that there is little difference between the morals of those claiming the title of Christian and the morals of those who have no Christian affiliation. Here are a few examples from the study which compared born-again Christians and non-Christians. Number of people who bought a lottery ticket in the last week, born-again Christians, 23%. Non-Christians, 27%. People who have watched an X-rated movie in the past three months, born-again Christians, 9%. Non-Christians, 16%. Okay, a little bit of a difference there. People who have attended a community meeting regarding a local issue of concern in the past year, born-again Christians, 37%. Non-Christians, 42%. People who have given money to a homeless person or a poor person in the past year, born-again Christians, 24%. Non-Christians, 34%. Not surprisingly, the author of this post concludes that in spite of all the sermons about how belief makes a difference in life, the numbers show that those claiming to be Christians are not better off than unbelievers. I have to say that as a preacher, when I read these two posts, as well as others like them, I was concerned However, I was not wholly surprised. Years ago, I took a job as a heavy metal chemist in San Francisco Bay Area in a small plating company with roughly 120 employees. The goal was to earn some money, take a break from my studies, and apply for a doctoral program. While I was working there, I was preparing for my ordination exams. So during my lunch breaks, I would sit at a picnic table out in the front of the plant, eat my lunch, and read through the Bible, the Presbyterian Book of Confessions, and the Presbyterian Book of Order, and take copious notes. When I began studying for my ordination exams during lunch, word seemed to have gotten around, because something strange began to happen. At first, it was the maintenance guy with whom I worked rather closely who took me aside and whispered in my ear, I believe in God. I just don't believe in the church. Then it was the manager of the quality control department with whom I worked rather less closely, who again took me aside and whispered in my ear, I believe in God. I just don't believe in the church. Then the office manager, with whom I worked even less closely, took me aside and whispered in my ear, I believe in God, I just don't believe in the church. Over the next few months, over two dozen people took me aside and said the same thing to me. I believe in God, I just don't believe in the church. For years, I pondered this strange experience. After years of pondering, here is my conclusion. We Christians too often make poor witnesses to the transforming power of God's love in Jesus Christ. 
Indeed, we often serve as stumbling blocks for the faith of other people. In our reading from the letter of Paul to the Galatians in chapter 5, Paul tells the people of the churches of the Galatia, yes, you are called to freedom. In Jesus Christ, you are no longer bound by the law, for your salvation no longer depends upon what you do. Instead, your salvation is solely dependent upon the grace of God. But please, 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 in your freedom, choose to be different. Choose to live by the Spirit by serving one another in love rather than satisfying your selfish impulses. Indeed, Paul lists the works of the flesh which stem from selfish impulses and result in self-indulgence. Now, you might notice that these words are a little different than the ones in the scriptures. Paul says, the things of self-indulgence are doing what feels good, losing your temper, fighting, idolatry, obsession, competitive opposition, jealousy, and group rivalry. Paul tells us that the spirit is set against these things. Indeed, the spirit is sent, set against selfish desires, so that when we are guided by the spirit, we can be different. We can be different living lives that are characterized not by self-indulgence, but are characterized by loving one another. Indeed, living lives that are characterized by what Paul calls the fruit of the Spirit. Living lives that are characterized by love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are the fruit born of the Spirit. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. I am the vine, and you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. Like the Indian-style serpents, and the Chinese-style dragons bearing witness to a person's national allegiance to the king of Laos or the king of Vietnam. The fruit that we bear bears witness to our spiritual allegiance. Is our spiritual allegiance to the kingdom of this world, or is it to the kingdom of God? The light turned amber. Just as the driver approached the intersection, the driver did the right thing. He stopped at the pedestrian crossing, even though he could have beaten the red light if he'd accelerated through the intersection. Then he heard it. The honking horn behind him. The tailgating woman behind him was furious. She leaned on her horn, screamed obscenities at him, and dropping her cell phone, she gestured out the window at him violently. She was mid-rant when there was a tapping on the window on the passenger's side. She looked over to see a serious-looking police officer peering in at her. When she lowered the window, he asked her to pull over and get out of the car with her hands up. He took her to the police station where she was searched, fingerprinted, photographed, and put in a holding cell. After a couple of hours, a policeman came to the cell and opened the door. 
The woman was then escorted back to the booking desk where the arresting officer was waiting for her with her personal effects. He said to her, I am so very sorry about this mistake. You see, I pulled up behind your car while you were blowing the horn, gesturing out the window, and cussing like a wharf rat at the bloke ahead of you. And I noticed the what would Jesus do st bumper sticker on your car, the God is my co-pilot plate, and the Christian fish emblem on your back window. So naturally, I assumed the car was stolen. <laughs> so when those around you watch the way you act, the way you live, what will they conclude? Will they assume that you belong to the kingdom of this world? Or will they assume that you belong to the kingdom of God? Think about it. Amen.